Hi, I'm Sébastien Antoine, and I will be the host for this session of the Association of European Researchers in Brazil webinar series dedicated to introduce fellow European researchers to the nuts and bolts of the Brazilian academia. Today, we will deal with an important and key step of the academic career in Brazil, the public selection process for university professors. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our main speaker today, Klaus Hartfelder, full professor at the University of São Paulo Medical School at Ribeirão Preto. Our second speaker had unfortunately to cancel a participation due to urgent personal reasons, and we hope to be able to welcome her again in an upcoming session. In the meanwhile, another colleague, fellow colleague from Porto Alegre, Nicolas Maillard, agreed to jump in at the last minute to give us an overview of the specificities of the federal university system, somehow different from the uh, Sao Paulo system one uh, in which Close is working. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the next and last webinar of this first series will happen next month on October the 20th, and we, be, and we deal with the way Brazilian universities, both on the undergrad and postgraduate levels, is working in the everyday life. Without any delay, I will give the floor to Close for his contribution. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today to talk about the Brazilian university system. Uh, and uh, especially on how to become a uh, professors. So it's uh, 8,000 to 15,000 real salary questions. That's about what you have to think <laughs> in terms of salary. This is an important part of the decision you're making. And uh, as Sebastian said, I'm a, a professor, a full professor at the University of Sao Paulo at the uh, medical school of the Liberal Preto, the uh, University of Sao Paulo. So about 300 kilometers from uh, the city of Sao Paulo. Now, uh, there are important questions to consider. One is uh, what are actually the Brazilian universities and their different types? Um, if you think about um, Brazilian universities, they're public universities. Uh, they are federal, they're state universities, or they are municipal universities. And then there are private nonprofit universities, which are generally confessional, like the Catholic universities, the Lutheran University in Porto Alegre, or are maintained by um, NGOs, non governmental organizations, such as the Universidade Sumbi de Palmares. And then there are private profit oriented universities and actually quite a lot. And um, they are uh, on Brazilian or international capital. There are enormous differences in academic quality. And this is something you have to consider. If you look at the Latin American university rankings from Times Higher Education, uh, you'll get an idea on where these universities are actually uh, appearing in the list. Uh, this is just the first, the first four, which I uh, took on the screen here. The first one is the um, Catholic University in Chile. So you can see, like in Brazil, the Catholic universities are actually rather high ranking. Uh, the University in Chile is the first one. And then comes the University of Sao Paulo, which is a very large public university in Sao Paulo. 90,000 students, um, 800, eight, um, 800 uh, professors. And so it's a very large university it's, uh, compared to very large ones uh, all around the world. The University of Campinas, also in the state of Sao Paulo, and then the Federal University of Sao Paulo. So as you can see already, there's something uh, going on in Sao Paulo about the high ranking universities. But then uh, uh, closely beyond come um, federal universities from all over Brazil. That's just to give you an idea on uh, rankings. Now, another question is, is it necessary that you're Brazilian if you become uh, a professor in a public university? No, it's not. Uh, I uh, took a, a picture of the legislation, which has a single paragraph, paragraph three, which says federal universities and scientific 
and uh, technological research institutions have the permission to hire foreigners as professors, technicians, and scientists. So there are no restrictions. And in fact, I'm not Brazilian. I uh, registered as a foreigner and continue to be here since, for over 20 years. Now, about becoming a professor, it's, a, it's the question of the hiring process. And uh, different from um, what you may know uh, in European, US, or other uh, countries, the um, hiring process in Brazil is highly regulated by Brazilian law. And the position openings are obligatorily published in the um, Diário da União, which is a public organ where every every step of uh, governmental or state um, uh, decisions, uh, governmental decisions, have to be published. For for the federal um, university, it's the Diário da União. For the public, for the state, it's the Diário do Estado, and so on. So you can find it there. Uh, the details. And uh, but before applying. This is what you should consider. Get informed about the university you are interested in and establish this contact with colleagues and or, or visit the institution as short-term visiting professor. Uh, I, this is a recommendation from my own personal experience because it um, makes it a lot easier for you to see how the whole system works. And they, uh, your colleagues, who are interested in having you as a colleague will help you um, with this not very simple um, application procedure. Uh, I as a visiting professor, I listed a, a program which is very open to um, public universities. It's the called PRINT, a Programa de Internacionalização of CAPES. Uh, it takes, uh, it considers student or postgraduate student uh, exchange abroad, uh, but it also considers visits by uh, professors from abroad to Brazil, short or long term. And this allows would allow you to get an idea of how the institution your institute in joining will uh, is organized and you, you will be able to make contact and see actually in place in local what is going on. Now, uh, I call this the concurso in public universities because the concurso, that's actually uh, where you are um, being interviewed, uh, is very different from what you may know in uh, universities in Europe or in other countries. Because as I said, the positions have to be announced and published in detail in an edital. Uh, this is uh, a detailed description of all the entire process of hiring. And this has to be published in the Diario de União or Diario do Estado. And as I said, ask, make sure you ask your Brazilian, Brazilian colleagues about the details and documents that you have to provide. Uh, for instance, the edital defines the exact area of the position and provides all the details on the hiring exam. For instance, the 10 or more topics, usually 10 to 15 topics for a written exam and the teaching exam. Um, don't be surprised. You, are, you will be taking a written exam just like a student. You will have to write for several hours. And also you have a teaching exam where you will be examined in, uh, co in the time of, because uh, a simulation of a lecture that you will be giving. Uh, then there are required documents like uh, your, your passport, your, or, or if you already have it, your uh, national registration as a foreigner, and uh, of course the certificate of your doctorate uh, issued by an academic institution abroad. Maybe it already needs, uh, an official translation may not be required at this point, but it will be when you uh, actually pass the concurso and will be hired. So that's another um, issue that takes time to get an official translation uh, and uh, a, a recognition. And then there's the last thing, the memorial. 
what is a memorial? It's a sphinx. Uh, and, and what a memorial is not, it is not your CV or bio sketch in four to 15 pages. And is also not your lattice CV. What, what's a lattice CV? The, the, the lattice uh, is actually your official um, CV, uh, it can have, if you print it out, mine ha would have about 70 pages. <laughs> of course, you wouldn't submit that. Uh, it's the, um, uh, your CV, which is registered at the um, CNPQ site, which is the Brazilian um, main, main, uh, federal funding organization for um, projects. And it's obligatory for any scientists also for our students, postgraduate students, and even graduate students have their lattice CV uh, <clears throat> because this uh, will be um, a record of all your achievements during your ca career. So it, this is not a memorial. Don't get that mixed up. It took me quite a while to understand what a memorial is. And that's what I consider is a memorial. Um, Brazilian like history stories. So it's a description of your personal history, memories. That's why it's called Memorial. And um, the Memorial, you may even include events. You may describe them as events that marked your childhood, high school, uh, and then uh, such decisions which made you actually progress or make certain choices in your, in your life. So uh, the, the initial part is a description of your personal history. It's also a description of your academic experience. And uh, it includes a description of the most important publication. It's not a listing of the publications at this point. It's a description of actually what you did, what you consider important. It's a description of how you think uh, as a scientist and how you think as a future professor. It also includes uh, deep uh, descriptions of your postdoctoral experience. I'm just saying I was there. It says what you did and what, how you considered that experience as important for a future decision. And actually anything you consider relevant uh, for the position that you're applying for. So um, make sure, um, as I said, it's not a CV or bio sketch which you can send around to, to any institution, which is uh, not very specific. A memorial should be always be specifically prepared for each concurso, because each position has uh, certain idiosyncrasies. And then uh, the second part uh, of the memorial, that looks much more like a CV. It's the second part and list your publication, talks, courses you taught. It's just like the CV lattice, just a bit shorter. So this is what I think is a memorial. <laughs> there are different ideas what is a memorial, but uh, if you consider it as, as a two-step description, first a personal description of memories, and then a second one where you uh, present your data in a more uh, structured way, okay? That's a memorial. And then comes the selection process. Actually, uh, this, uh, the, the selection there's a selection committee, which is called the Banca. And then there are the, the uh, is the day or the days of the, uh, of the exam. It can take several days, depending on how many candidates applied for this position. And uh, by Brazilian law, every candidate who fulfills the requirement for the application, that is, has a doctorate, is eligible to participate in this process. Uh, any candidate who has a doctorate in the respective area of the concurso. So the concurso defines which area and your, your doctorate has to be in that area to be included. But um, the, uh, there may be many candidates and there's no prior selection other than the qualification by the doctorate in the area. And uh, all candidates are allowed to uh, have the permission to participate in the selection process. And therefore there is a selection committee. Uh, this is the Banca, which consists of generally five professor professors. 
which are indicated by the department and um, uh, of the respective university. And they are, have to be approved, their names have to be approved by the faculty or the, uh, or the university council. So this will be the bunker. And from this step on, when this bunker is defined, uh, a date will be set for the exam. The date is being set by the, uh, by the, um, by the bunker group so that they can all be present uh, in, at, the, at, the, at that time. At the day of the exam, and all candidates must be there, and that is important. At the day of the uh, can, uh, exam, all candidates must be present on time. I've been on a selection committee where a very interesting candidate arrived five minutes late. He was excluded. So it's just like a vestibular or an exam. There are no excuses, okay? Because this is all highly defined by Brazilian law. And then there are um, about the sequence of the exam. Uh, the first step is that one of the 10 or more topics is randomly drawn for the written exam. And uh, this is generally the same for all candidates. So they can all uh, be compared. Uh, and uh, for this exam, uh, typically, you have one hour for consultation of material, so you can bring a suitcase of material for all these different topics. You have one, one hour time to write a, a short sketch of, uh, on the topic that it was selected. And uh, with this sketch, but not any uh, material, you have four hours for writing uh, uh, about this topic. And then this topic will be analyzed, the, the, all the, uh, the exams from all the candidates will be examined by the bunker and they will um, evaluate whether uh, the candidate, the respective candidates uh, achieved a certain uh, percentage points, which is usually 70%, and they will get to the next stage. All the ones who did not make this threshold will be excluded from the next step of the, of the concurso. So this is uh, usually the first very important step. The next step is usually the teaching exam where one of the 10 or more topics that were defined or before the, well before the concurso uh, <clears throat> will be chosen. And it may be the same for all candidates, which can be pretty tiresome <laughs> for the banca to hear the, the same story 10 times, uh, or it may be different. Uh, so this is a part of, uh, of a decision which is uh, uh, written in the edital or is defined by the banca. And uh, frequently the edital, the edital may allow for a 24 hour period for the preparation of the uh, actually teaching exam, the, the lecture that uh, you will have to give. And it's important that this lecture is 40 to 60 minutes. Don't, you're not allowed to make it shorter and you're not allowed to make it longer. Let's say if you do so, you will, um, your, your points will be diminished. Uh, your, you will receive uh, a lesser grade for this. So you're being graded, don't forget that. And the last step, usually a, a final step, is the discussion, the discussion of the memorial with the banca. So there you will be discussing with the banca about your life, about your experience, about your, um, your research, about uh, your position with respect to universities, um, your uh, plans for uh, for your future. Uh, sometimes, uh, not always, um, you will have to present a research project that is compatible with the area uh, of the concurso. Th this is um, more, it is not obligatory. The first three steps, the written exam, the teaching exam, and the dis discussion of the memorial, the arguisal, that is obligatory in practically all uh, um, job descriptions for a professor in a university, okay? So that is the day of the exam. 
or the days, as I said, it may take a week if there are 30 candidates and uh, imagine uh, all, uh, each one will have to give a lecture, each one will have a um, uh, discussion of the memorial with the banca, uh, which uh, may take up to four hours, uh, two to three hours per candidate. You can imagine that this will take a, an entire week. So then there comes the next step. That is the hiring process. Uh, in the hiring process, uh, after the, the, the exam results, uh, which are uh, rating the candidates from one to, well, you want to be the first, okay? <laughs> you want to be the first or uh, at least the second. Um, the exam results must be uh, validated by the faculty or the university council. So th that's, that may take some time, uh, a few weeks. And if you're um, a foreigner, a national validation of your doctoral degree will be required. So uh, it's the diploma and your thesis. And uh, this is a step that can take a couple of months. So before that is not done, you may not actually be hired. Also, it will be required that you re uh, register as foreigner or become uh, apply for a, uh, to become a Brazilian national. And um, the registration of a foreigner is, is a card, uh, the Registro Nacional de Estrangeiro, which I have uh, with a permanent vi uh, visa. This will be required and you will also be required to have a tax number, uh, so-called CPF uh, tax registry which has already, already been presented in uh, one of the last webinars in much more detail. But um, the CPF is like your ID, your personal ID. And then uh, finally, uh, the contract will be issued and uh, you will have to start teaching. You will have to uh, get into the university life. That's the, the, the hiring process. And there's one thing important, especially over the last years, there have been uh, changes in retirement rules uh, and um, the retirement rules are changing. And uh, so be aware of these changes uh, as a career, during your career as a public servant. Uh, always pay attention to this. So, as I said, these are the rules for public universities, which I know, which um, usually my, my colleagues on, this, on the webinar, Sebastian, Nicola, uh, and Marie know very well. Uh, those for private or non profit universities, the Catholic University, Ulbra, Methodist, Methodist um, University of Palmares, or community colleges, may be very similar. Usually, they're similar. But uh, the propositions openings don't have to be published in the Diario da Unión or Diario do Estado. You will find this at different places. Uh, if you have uh, a networking, if you're networking with colleagues, they will inform you about these uh, position openings and they will guide you uh, through the process on, on the application and so on. Uh, actually, those for private, uh, profited universities, which may be faculties, colleges, uh, they, will fo they follow institutional rules for hiring, hiring and salary def definitions. So they, um, they are different for each institution. So you, uh, if you are interested in that, um, there are no general guidelines uh, which I would be able to give you. And then there are important decisions uh, the decision to become a professor in a Brazilian university, I would say, is a personal project. It's, it's not, not like uh, getting a postdoc position or entering as an exchange student. It's a long-term, very long-term uh, personal project. So um, just to give an idea on my own history, I obtained my PhD in biology at the University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, from 1982 to 1986. And during my uh, doctorate, uh, I spent 
18 months, and that's tw twice nine months at the University of Sao Paulo in Ribeira Preto, exactly where I'm now. So I have a very long-term uh, contact uh, with colleagues here at this university. But after my doctorate, I uh, <laughs> was lucky, was lucky to get an assistant professor uh, position at the University of in, in Tübingen um, from 1986 to 1998. And during this time, uh, I, I had my habilitation, which is uh, in Brazil, would be equivalent to a leave of docencia. And uh, during these years, I took a postdoctoral fellowship leave uh, financed by the German Science Foundation, DFG, for nine months, which I spent um, at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And then I went back uh, after this postdoctoral position, I uh, uh, went back to my assistant prof uh, professor position at the University of T Tübingen, which, uh, for which I had taken this leave. In 1996, um, I took, uh, continuing actually as a assistant professor, I took, um, let's say uh, a, it's not a different job it's just um, i became the coordinator of the promata project a promata uh, uh, laboratory of the university of tubingen uh, in, at the catholic university in Porto Alegre. this is an international binational project a large project on um, uh, environmental policies in, in, um, uh, in forestry areas. And uh, from 1996 to 1998, the decision ripened to make a move to, towards Brazil, a definite move towards Brazil. And this was made possible because in 1997, um, the CAPES and the DAD, the German uh, ex uh, Academic Exchange Organization, opened a program specifically for Brazil for visiting professors from Germany. Uh, so they were uh, hiring visiting professors for, from Germany for, on a five year contract. This was exceptional because I had mentioned before the Brazilian retirement rules. In uh, 1996, 1997, there was a major change in, it, in environment rules and many public servants, including university professors decided to retire. And there was no chance that the Brazilian universities would fill this position uh, in, in, on, a, on a short term. So uh, with this uh, Capis DAD um, agreement, uh, which was a special agreement, as I said, they were offering visiting professor terms for German academics. And I was lucky to obtain one of those from 1998 to 2003. I had made this arrangement with my colleagues from the Department of Biology of the um, um, University of Sao Paulo faculty uh, on biology, which includes the Department of Biology in Ribeiro Preto and whom I, I've been knowing for uh, almost 20 years before that. And uh, during that time, I um, made another, uh, I made another lever de sensei in 2001, which uh, put me into a, an associate professor equivalent. So at the end of this uh, five year fellowship, uh, a position opened in the medical school of Ribeiro Preto in the Department of Cell Biology, Molecular Biology. And uh, I made a concurso in 2003. And so in uh, June 2004, I was hired and uh, I was an associate professor at, uh, the, at the Department of Cell Biology until 2013, when another concurso opened for a full professor. And um, I passed this concurso. And uh, since then, I'm a full professor at the Department of Cell Biology. Uh, of the Ribeiro Pedro Medical School. I'm teaching embryology 
human embryology. I'm not uh, a, a, a physician. I'm not, I didn't study medicine. I studied biology. Um, so <clears throat> that's why I'm right now. But actually, this is the academic story. But each of us has a private story behind it. And they're important um, facts. Like uh, I got married in 1985. My wife is Brazilian. I knew her, got, uh, got to know her, and we, we married during the second, my second stay in the Preta as a, a doctoral student. And then there were five years of traveling back and forth to Brazil uh, between 1985 and 1990, because my wife became a professor at uh, uni the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Florianopolis. And we were in different con uh, continent, uh, continents. So as you can see, there are private, uh, personal projects uh, involved in this. And there were two years of Lufthansa travels while I was the coordinator of the Bromata Lab in, two, in, uh, in Porto Alegre and at the same time uh, teaching in, at the University of uh, in, uh, Tübingen in Germany. So every three months I was traveling back and forth. <laughs> and uh, finally, when um, we both settled in uh, Ribeirão Preto, my wife had applied for um, had made a concurso um, in uh, phys in physiology, human physiology, uh, at a, um, the dentistry school here in Ribeiro Preto. Uh, she had gotten her po a position in 1996, and then I came in 1998 with a uh, entire moving my entire uh, <laughs> furniture to Brazil in 1998, and in 2000 we built our house, and since then we're living here. So that's the personal story. Um, just to get, give you an idea that uh, becoming a professor in, in a Brazilian university is, is, a, is, a pro, is a personal project. It's not like uh, getting a postdoc position for two, one or two years or becoming a graduate student. I think that's uh, the message that I could give uh, for now. So uh, I will interrupt my presentation here and um, be ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Klaus. Uh, it was it was a quite extensive uh, presentation of how things are working in Brazil, how Concurso is working. We are used to that in Brazil, but for European Union is quite different. And we have uh, Nicola Maillard now. Uh, he's professor in uh, the University uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul uh, in, in Porto Alegre. And Nicola will give us uh, some insights about the way things are working in the federal system. So, so close, uh, explain us the way it's working basically in the Sao Paulo system. There is a lot of uh, common things with the federal system, but Nicola will uh, help us to understand that better. Thanks a lot. Right. So I, I won't give as many details as, as Klaus did. I just wanted to come back to most of the points he made and, and present themselves then again. So the first thing I think, as Klaus said, uh, the plan to get a position as a federal professor is really a life project. Uh, Klaus spoke about the personal uh, issues which are related to this project. I want to come back to the profile, what is expected from a, a full professor in a Brazilian university. Uh, of course, from a European point of view, it's very obvious that you probably want to do research. You are certainly aware that some teaching uh, is associated to a position of professor. It's important to know that in Brazil, uh, all universities and all university professors have three mandatory missions, teaching, research, and what we call in Portuguese, extensão, which can be roughly translated by outreach or social mission, or the third mission of the university, as sometimes it's called this way in Europe, which are all activities which engage uh, the university with the society as a whole. So bridging activities, maybe if you are uh, working in the, in the field of health, like Klaus, maybe it means uh, uh, attending the public for, for dentistry, for instance. Or uh, if you're a computer scientist like I am, maybe you want to work with uh, in a, in a, a poor neighborhood to develop uh, the access to the internet, for instance. So it's important to be aware that as a professor in Brazil, you'll have to do something on at least 
those three dimensions. You can't only be a researcher. And this is, uh, that's the main point I think I want to make here. If you expect to be hired in a Brazilian university only to do research, you, you'll be disappointed because you will have to teach in the classroom and it will be a, a fair amount of your time. If you define yourself more as a teacher than as a researcher, you're, you will also find some limitation in your career in Brazil because you, you, you have to do also research if you really want to, to get promoted and to, to, to get inserted in the Brazilian Academy, you have to do both. And you also have to have to, to keep in mind this extension activity, which is important and it, which is getting more important. Uh, those last couple of years, for instance, the law has changed in Brazil and we now have to, it's a duty of the university to insert activities of outreach in the curricula uh, at all undergraduate levels. So as professor, you need to provide to your students those cultural, social activities of asking some else you're not doing your job as a professor. And at some point you'll have some, some problem. Uh, and of course you have all the rest, uh, PhD, master supervision. Uh, it's kind of optional. Uh, at least in the federal system, you're hired as a professor and your only mandatory uh, courses at, at, are at undergraduate level. But most probably you will, you will get involved with uh, graduate studies and you'll want to advise PhD student or master student, which means a whole totally set of skills and enough work than if you only work at undergraduate level. You'll have lots of administrative responsibilities. You'll be a, research, a resource and project manager in Brazil. We do have some funding for uh, the day-to-day -day activities of the universities. But most of the public funding is based on editais, as Klaus uh, said, uh, which are calls, public calls for, for money. And it's a very important part of our job as professors in universities in Brazil to go after the money, to be able to, to write applications, to, to convince our national or, or state agency that as researcher, as advisors, we deserve uh, to, to win the competition and get some of the money which is offered. If, if you don't do this, if you don't act as, a, as an active resource manager looking forward to getting more, more funding, you simply won't have all the, the necessary uh, tools to be able to, to do your research, to, to, to fund your students and so on and so forth. So you have to be really aware that uh, this is also an important part of the, of the job of a professor in a university. Of course, it's pretty similar to what happens in many other countries, especially in Europe, but be aware that depending on your country in Europe, maybe uh, the organization and the kind of things you have to do as a professor maybe are not exactly the same as, as, as they are in Brazil. Now, uh, Quickly, I wanted to come back to what Klaus has already presented. In the federal system, the positions of professor are, are defined at the national level, at the federal level, the federal government, the Ministry of Higher Education defines how many uh, teaching staff which, or researching staff, which, which is what we're discussing now, uh, will, will, will be, how many positions will be open in a given year. Uh, there are many, many national policies consideration which drive uh, the increase or the decrease in terms of position. Uh, some of the regions in Brazil are uh, not as developed as, as others. So sometimes the government, the federal government wants to put the emphasis on a given state in Brazil, which uh, requires increases in terms of higher education. So more positions are open. Sometimes it's the contrary. Uh, we don't have budget at the federal level anymore. So positions are closed or are not renewed. It's not a secret. On the contrary, it's a totally public matter right now that those last four years, the current government are, are pretty much cut down all budgets of higher education, which meant that we had a very limited number of positions open. So it really depends on governmental policies and politics and national policies. Now, once the Ministry of Higher Education decides that in, in a given state, in a given federal university, some positions will be open, 
it's up to the university to distribute those positions among their departments. And then you have a local policy matter. Each university has to define how many, which departments uh, need or deserve more or less positions. It depends on the previous number of professors. If some professors are retiring, probably their positions should be substituted by new colleagues hired. It depends, of course, on the strategic importance of given fields of study. And this is from all over the world. All departments in all universities compete among, among themselves uh, to, 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 to convince that uh, they need some new professors. So you have to be aware of this internal uh, political situation in a given university to make sure that position could open, which relates to your own field of, of, of study, of, of work. And at some point, uh, the positions are decided on a given department, then the university will, will launch a call. As Klaus said, it's a very public matter, a very transparent matter. It's very bureaucratic, but it also means that it has to be very transparent. Uh, so the, the difficulty, I think, is not really to find the information is that once a call is issued, you have somehow too much information. And uh, it's specifically for a foreigner, it's so much information that sometimes it's very hard to find the relevant information among an ocean of, of possibilities and, and criteria and, and documents which have to be consulted. So probably at, at this stage, you really need an insider's help, someone who, who will be able to support you from the department where you want to apply, uh, a, a colleague, people like Klaus, like myself, who will be able to tell you, look, you have to read that document, the deadlines are those, uh, and, and you have to start gathering this and that document. Then at the department level, uh, the jury, the banca, as we say in Portuguese, as Klaus said, uh, will be organized and the exact details of the exams and, and, and the, 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 the agenda of the exam will be, will be decided. As Klaus mentioned, it can, it can take a lot of time. If you have 15, 20, maybe 30 candidates for a given position, uh, the whole exam will take one whole week, maybe 10 days, maybe two weeks. And as Klaus really well described, you can't, as a candidate, you can't miss any of the steps. You have to be there, which means that you have to plan to be available during days and days and days to be able to, to, to be part of uh, the selective process. Uh, all the schedule will be very public, very transparent. You will know weeks before, maybe months before, when it will start, when it will end, when the results will be published. But you have to be aware that it will be a long process to, to, be, to be selected and hired. Now, the selective process is organized um, uh, in four main uh, parts. So I wanted to briefly touch once more uh, on those four parts. Klaus has mentioned more all of them actually, but I wanted to, to come back and give some more uh, insight on, on this one. So uh, the four parts are the CV, uh, some written essay or dissertation, what's something we call a prova didactica, which is a didactic uh, exam and the memorial or research project that Klaus mentioned. So first uh, the dissertation which in my university, at, at, at least we start by the dissertation. It's a written essay on one topic, which is uh, randomly, randomly uh, uh, sorted uh, on, on your field of knowledge. It may seem very strange to have to, to write an essay. As, as Klaus said, it, it's something which uh, seems to, to relate to, to the, the student entry exam, not, not, to, not to a professor's uh, entry exam. Uh, but still, it's a very important piece of the puzzle uh, of, of this selective process. Uh, I've been part of juries to, to select professors in my university and in other ones, and actually it's a very selective part of the whole process. Uh, maybe because I'm a computer scientist, so it's also a field where we're not used to writing that much as in humanities, say, but uh, it's very interesting to see how much a candidate is able 
to provide a synthesis of his or her views on a research field uh, in a few pages. For the candidates, it's very trying because you really have to, to be ready to write during six hours, uh, pages and pages and pages of uh, impromptu texts on, on your field of research. Or, so it's, it's quite uh, difficult actually for many, for many candidates. Also, it's very important to, to say that for foreigners, most of the time, this first uh, essay will be written in Portuguese. Uh, increasingly, and especially in, in, in large universities, those that Klaus mentioned uh, in the top five of the, of the Latin American ranking, probably are beginning to accept uh, this kind of essays in English, but it's still an internationalization process in our universities, which is in an early stage. So uh, especially if you apply to maybe a smaller university for a more uh, remote state, probably you will have to do this in, in Portuguese. So it also means that you have to be fluent and able to, to provide a, a structured document written in Portuguese in a fixed and limited amount of time. So that's the first uh, uh, kind of, of exam. Then very importantly, you have the Prova Didachka. It's uh, the simulation of a, of a, of a class. Uh, again, Klaus described it very well. You, 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 some topic will be chosen randomly and you, you have 24 hours to prepare a class. In many ways, uh, when, you, when you, the candidates in this exam provide the perfect class. I mean, uh, I, in, in the real life of a teacher, you probably won't prepare that, that good a class as you do for this, for this uh, exam, because you really want to, to provide the best possible didactic experience uh, to the jury. It's very important to understand that it's not a test of the candidate's knowledge of the area. The area. It's, a, it's a didactic test. So what matters in this exam, the Prova Didachka, is really to convince the jury that you know how to behave in a classroom, that you know how to explain something to undergraduate students, that you know that you have to give a list of exercises at the end, that you have to use the whiteboard or PowerPoint slides, or I don't know, whatever uh, uh, multimedia example you want to use. You have to, to really work on your didactics. You have to show that you're a good teacher which again relates to those fundamental missions of a professor in the Brazilian universities. As I was saying, if you want to be hired only to do research, probably you won't work at one point. And this exam, the Prova Didachka, is really conceived to be able to filter out those of us, those academics who are very bright researchers, but who, who are not as good as teachers. So you really have to prepare, be ready to know how to manage a classroom. And again, even if, in, even if in many institutions today in Brazil, this kind of exam is getting internationalized, you have to be aware that you have to convince the Brazilian jury that your didactic is appropriate for a Brazilian audience. So you, it's a good idea to have a, a previous experience of how a Brazilian classroom behaves, how Brazilian students behave, what, what is expected from the professor in the Brazilian classroom, which may or may not be different from the experience in a European country. Uh, to give you a, a very personal and brief example, I, I'm French. I come from a French Grand École d'Ingénieur and the way I was taught there the way I had to behave as a student is very different from the way my students behave in my university and from the way I, I give my classes in, in Brazil. Uh, the relationship between myself and my students here in Brazil is much closer than what it used to be in, 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 my, in my French uh, institution. So, so it's a good idea also to have a previous experience of uh, the, the Brazilian classroom to be able to really get ready for this Prova Didachka. 
Third, you have the research project of Memorial. Klaus insisted a lot on the aspect uh, memories of the, of the Memorial. I'd like to highlight uh, the importance of also presenting in this exam a research project. Uh, at least in my university, in the federal system, it's as much about your past as academic as it is about your, your immediate future. Uh, in, in this research project or memorial, you are meant to convince the jury that if you are hired as a professor, you know immediately how to start your career as a group leader, as a research group leader. So uh, you should simulate in this memorial or not simulate, but plan what, 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 are, what, what are your next steps as a researcher and as a professor to which agencies will you apply to get funding? How many master PhD students do you think you can advise in the next couple of years? How are you going to, to plan and devise your career as a young professor in the next five years? This kind of uh, horizon of, of, of personal view on what you're going to do as a professor if hired is important in this research project or memorial because it's one more way to convince the jury that you know what it takes and have what it takes to be a professor in, in the Brazilian higher education system. Finally, you have to provide also a CV. So again, Klaus mentioned it. Uh, there's only one more detail I wanted to say about the CV, which is very, very important and very challenging for foreigners. It's not only about the CV, it's not a bit it's not only about listing what you did, what you published, uh, your, 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 your education and so on. In the Brazilian system, unfortunately, it's also a lot about proving that what is written in your CV really was done. So it means that it, it, it's not enough to provide a few pages of text listing what you did. You also have to append a lot of certificates, a lot of letters, whatever kind of document really proves somehow uh, that, that, that what you did, that, that, that what you claimed you did, you did it really. Uh, and this is a very complicated matter for Freiner because it's a very specific uh, uh, cultural thing in Brazil. Uh, you, already you always have to prove that what you're stating is true. If you don't have any supporting document, probably you won't be believed. So again, regarding the CV, it's very important to understand that the CV will be read by the jury. You will have points based on the kinds of achievements that, that are stated in your CV. But in order to get the points, you have to have supporting documents. So if you say in your CV that you got a master degree in, I don't know, 25 uh, in that university, you have to provide the, the, the certificate, the diploma together. If you say that you published a paper in an international peer reviewed journal, you have to provide, uh, if not a physical copy, a physical issue of the journal, at least some copy of the, of the cover of the journal where your name is so that people, will, the jury will be convinced that you really published what you said you published and so on and so forth. So actually what we call CV here is much more than a CV. It's a CV plus sometimes whole boxes of supporting documents uh, that the jury will consult. If you don't have the supporting document, you won't get the points for what you're claiming that you did, which is quite shocking for many foreigners and also for Brazilian to be, to be fair, because it means that Basically, people don't trust you when you say or when you write that you did something, that you achieved something. Uh, but that's the way it is, and uh, we can lament it, but we have to comply by the rules. If you want to get the points for your CV, you have to provide lots of supporting documents. Uh, we're running out of time difficulties. Um, so first to define the, the positions, it's very hard to anticipate when some positions will be open. It's both a national process and a local one. There's no regular fixed calendar every September or every June of each year, you have positions open. It doesn't work like that. 
positions can open at any point during the year. You have to have an insider's help to, to be warned when some positions are planned to open. Uh, the duration of the process is complex for a foreigner. As I was saying, it takes months first to get ready for, for, the, for the exam. Then the, the exam can last one week, maybe two weeks, which means you have to come to Brazil during this period of time and be in Brazil during this period of time. Then, as Klaus said, it can take months uh, before the, the hiring process is completed for those who have passed the exam. So on the whole, it can take three, six, 12, 18 months between the, the, the opening of the position and the really the hiring, the, the end of the hiring process. Language is a difficulty. As I was saying, increasingly we can you can find places where you can apply in English, but mostly, mostly Portuguese will be mandatory, at, at least in some of the exams. You, you have to get ready to, to, to be able to convince in Portuguese at some point. Finally, uh, and Klaus also touched upon it, degree recognition and certificates is very important. If not during the exam, at least to, to get the position when you're hired to sign at the time when you sign the contract, you'll have to provide official translations, official recognitions of your degrees or PhD at the very least. And it's not something that you can get from one day to the other. It also takes, takes months. Uh, maybe maybe one whole year to get a PhD recognized in Brazil. So that's also something you have to, to, to plan in advance if you want to be ready for the day when you are hired. Okay, that's it, Sebastian. I think I talk too much, actually. Uh, I want to leave some still some time for the questions. So back to you. Thanks a lot, Nicolas. It was a really complimentary way of... Uh, um, contributing to the debate. Uh, but basically, I have two, one general comment and two specific questions for you. Uh, the first one is, uh, as you explained, it's quite a complicated process. It's quite different from the way we're used to, uh, to get uh, academic selection in Europe. Each country has its difference, of course, but uh, the process is quite different uh, and in the US as well. Um, so one observation is that most of the colleagues uh, in the association of people we know coming from Europe, who actually has a permanent position in Brazil now, are people who were already in Brazil before uh, passing, before getting through the concourse. So, so as a postdoc or stuff like that, uh, they managed to prepare uh, from those uh, uh, written and teaching exams. And that would be perhaps my, my first question. Uh, how did you prepare uh, yourself to those uh, to those exams to come back as a high school student at some extent writing a dissertation uh, or showing the perfect class as Nicolas said and what would be the advice you you have for your European colleagues wanting to prepare themselves to that so I will go first uh, indeed uh, as Klaus and uh, I was in Brazil uh, before I applied to my position. And I think, as you said, it's very important to be here as a postdoc to get ready. The very concrete uh, thing that I would recommend is simply to attend to, to some of those exams. They are very public sessions. Uh, so I did it and it was very interesting. You, you go and, and, and see one of those uh, exams and you 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 really see how people behave, uh, how the jury behaves. Uh, it's very important, I think, for everybody. Uh, that that's something I I I, I recommend to my Brazilian uh, former students who want to get a position to do. But even more for a foreigner, it's very important to be able to attend at least a few times to these kind of of sessions, uh, so that you have an internal feeling of what what's going on. Uh, for the didactic uh, exam, the best preparation is really to, to be able to teach before you, you, you apply to this kind of position. So again, as a postdoc student, as a visiting professor, you usually have some opportunity to, if, if not to, to be in charge of a, of a whole teaching course to, to, to at least uh, do some presentations together with a, with a, with a professor. 
So it's one of the best possible preparation. Um, and regarding the memorial and the, the, the research project, also as, as a postdoc, as a visiting professor, I think it's very important for you to, to see how Brazilian researchers work on writing research projects, applying to, to the national agencies, to CAPES, to CNPK, to FAPESP. Uh, it's something that our PhD students, our postdoc students do together with us as professor here in Brazil. So if you're a foreign postdoc, maybe make, make an extra effort to be part of this kind of activities in the host university so that you can know what kind of ingredients you have to put in the research project in, in the, uh, according to the Brazilian standards. And this in turn will translate into being ready to write a memorial for your, for your exam. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Nicola, that was uh, exactly, I'm there. Yeah, we, we are in the same, yeah. Okay, um, that's exactly uh, how, uh, these are very uh, excellent comments to participate, to sit in, a, in one of those selection uh, sessions as an outsider uh, and see how people are behaving, how, how the whole thing works. That's, that's uh, something you are highly recommendable. Um, also, uh, the getting a teaching opportunity before, great. Uh, as you mentioned, getting the certificates is very important, getting all your certificates together. In, in Europe, you don't need that. You just write your, um, your um, CV, short CV, and send it in. Um, but since in Brazil, if, uh, these, the hirement in, in the public universities in pu public positions are highly regulated by law, you have to prove uh, everything you did. And so at one point, this is strange, but on the other hand, this is the, the transparency, this guarantees the full transparencies. Everybody in the concurso is being judged on this. So they're all treated equal in this sense. And uh, the, there's no way you, you can get around this or anyone one can get around this. So this is a part of the transparency. And uh, this is different from um, the, the selection committees in Europe or um, in other universities, where the, uh, the, the selection, the first step of the selection, when the applications come in, is to invite a certain number of candidates based on um, the, the whole uh, list of applications uh, to make a pre-selection. This does not happen in Brazil. Everybody who is applying will have the chance to be here, to be heard. And that, that's very different. And I think that's one of the advantages, which is also makes it difficult for uh, sometimes for the hiring process because uh, there are many candidates which will appear. Um, so as I said, and uh, Nicola stressed it, get your certificates ready, have them organized. And then um, uh, ask, for instance, a memorial ask a colleague of yours for a memorial, the, 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 the memorial that he or she used to get the position. And that will give you an idea how to structure uh, your writing of, of a memorial. That's, um, the, the, these are the main points. Thanks, Klaus and Nicola. About this specific issue of uh, proof you have to present, we have a, a question about the expiration date of uh, translation and uh, official recognition of documents. So is there some kind of uh, expiration date or? There isn't for, for, for diploma, so really, the only point which prevents from rushing and, and having everything recognized, I'd say is the cost, because of course you will have to pay for some official translator, which is not cheap. I mean, it, it, it's not very expensive as well, but, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it has a cost. And then you also have to pay some fee to, to the university, which will actually do the recognition process. All this is done through a national uh, website, which is called um, Plataforma uh, Carolina Bori. Thank you, thank you, Miguel. Uh, 
so it, it can all be done online. That's not really difficult, but it takes time and, and it has a cost. So I, I, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know by heart the cost, the exact cost. I, it's not very expensive, but it's expensive enough maybe so that you don't want to do it if you don't really have a, a, a definite plan to, to come to Brazil. So if you if you're really sure you want to to, to work professionally with with Brazil or in Brazil, uh, I suggest you do it, uh, but but you have to consider the cost. Thanks. Uh, in terms of in terms of documents, it is only the really the the doctoral documents or the the, the, the university degrees that have to be officially translated you don't need translations for uh, participation in a congress or anything this is just a, a copy you add so it's only the very essential documents like the your university degrees uh, which have to be uh, translated and uh, it, once they're recognized uh, by a university um, by, or by officially recognized, you, you have already the, the translation. So th that's part of the process. Thanks a lot. We have a last question from uh, one of our fellow um, association member, Miguel from uh, Amapa, uh, asking us about uh, retirement. So Close uh, told us that there is like some change about that. So what will be the effect of the change for the career of future professors who are going to be hired to the next years? There was a major change in um, retirement rules in 2013. If you uh, are, were hired before, it's one story. After 2013, uh, you, you always will retire as, as at the top level of the ENSS, which is the federal government um, regulation, uh, list of uh, uh, retirement, which is currently about 5,600 reais, which I'm not, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, but there is always the possibility to have an addition, to, to have a complementary retirement plan. And, um, uh, the federal and states um, universities, they, um, if you have, if you, if you get a, uh, such a retire uh, retirement plan, they put in part of the money, uh, like 75, 7.5%. If you contribute to 7.5% of your salary with a retirement plan, they contribute with an equ equ uh, equal amount to the retirement plan. So if you uh, become a professor when you're young, at around 40, the latest, maybe, uh, you will have enough time to, to build up a retirement uh, plan, which um, allows you to, re to retire uh, rather comfortably. It, it's, it becomes a problem when you get a professor uh, much later. So th that's, that's part of the retirement. Thanks a lot. Um, so we reach uh, all the, the question. There is a last one um, about uh, the, the, if the requirements, so for instance, the education certificates, etc., have the same weight in the final score. So if the written exam, the teaching uh, exam, uh, the evaluation of the curricula, if uh, each of them have the same weight, of the, there is like a difference between them. Uh, there's so in, 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 yeah. Go ahead, Nicola. Uh, in my university and in the two other ones where I participated to juries, it was the same weight. So one fourth, one fourth, one fourth, one fourth for the for the fourth category. But this it's it's a decision which is up to the university. So I think Klaus is going to to say that in his experience, it's different. It's different. It can change from one university to the other. So it's with the call with the edital, you will have a detail, uh, a detailed punctuation sheet. So you'll know exactly how, how each specific note is computed based on which criteria and how the, the overall uh, note will be will be given. Uh, that's exactly. It's defined in the edital. Exactly defined in the edital which weight is given to each uh, exam. 
Uh, what I've seen frequently is that uh, Memorial has a higher weight because it's your CV, it's your history. Uh, and that uh, the written exam uh, and the teaching exam have the same weight. But as I said, um, the written exam is the first step in the, um, uh, in the day of the exam, in the exam process. And uh, if you're not doing well on that, <laughs> all, the, all the rest won't count. So you have to do well on the written exam. So thanks a lot, Klaus and Nicola. I think we reached the end of this webinar. Uh, it was an amazing way to introduce your pen colleagues to the way the selection process is working in Brazil. Uh, I will now share with you the schedule of our last uh, session. It will be about how a Brazilian university is organized. Uh, it will happen on October the 20th at uh, 10.30. Uh, and we will be quite happy to see you again uh, next month for this last uh, webinar session. Thanks to you all and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye.